Yes, it is. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Caitlin. I am the events coordinator at Square Books. Um, thank you all for joining us uh, to celebrate Kendara Blake's newest novel, uh, All These Bodies. And uh, Marissa Meyer is here to talk with her about it and uh, celebrate with us. Before we dive into that, um, I would like to tell you about a few upcoming events. I will try to keep it brief, but it's um, even in these strange times, we've got a pretty busy fall season for locals and um, uh, kind of remote events too. So here we go. Um, Thursday on the 23rd, 6 p.m., we have two options. If you uh, live locally, we'll be hosting Thacker Mountain Radio at the open air all, uh, Old Armory Pavilion with James Beard award-winning chef John Currents for his uh, cookbook, Tailgate, How to Crush It at Tailgating. Um, that's at 6 p.m. Uh, musical guests include singer-songwriters Anna Grace Beatty and Victoria Jones, and of course our house band will be there, house band, <laughs> uh, the Yellow Bushwhackers. If you are not in Oxford or not quite ready to mingle around, uh, you can join us on Zoom for Kristen Hanna in conversation with Christina Baker Klein. Um, we are hosting this event in partnership with our publisher friends Macmillan. Uh, we have signed book plate editions of Kristen's latest novel, Four Winds. You can learn more about it on our website. You can learn about all of this on our website. Um, then Friday, uh, 24th, if you're into Dapper Newsmen, uh, we're hosting Anderson Cooper for his new book, Vanderbilt, The Rise and Fall of an American Dynasty. Again, that's on Zoom at 5 p.m. Central Time. Um, this event is a little bit of a, an outlier because it does require the purchase of the book, but it's a really good one. Um, again, visit our website for more details. Next week, Tuesday, uh, the 28th, this is an event that is in store at Off Square. It is only our second one that we've done in the last 18 months. Um, so we're hosting Terriona Tank Ball. She's gonna be reading from her debut collection of poetry, Vulnerable AF, uh, before her performance as the front woman for Tank in the Bangas at Proud Larry's. Um, masks and proof of vaccination are required to attend. If you're not local, you can uh, give us a call or order online uh, a personally inscribed copy we ship um, while you're also buying all these bodies and you can just throw vulnerable AF in there too. Uh, last but not least, Wednesday, uh, September 29th, we are hosting a free virtual tarot workshop with Sasha Graham at 5.30 p.m. Central Time to celebrate her new book, uh, The Magic of Tarot, RSVP, RSVP is required. Um, all right, enough about them though. Uh, I would like to tell you about the lovely ladies uh, on your Zoom screen. Um, so Kendara Blake is Kendara Blake is the number one New York Times bestselling author of the Three Dark Crown series. She holds an MA in creative writing from Middlesex University in Northern London. And she is also the author of Anna Dressed in Blood, a Sybil's Award finalist, um, Girl of Nightmares, Anti-Goddess, Mortal Gods, and Ungodly. Her books have been translated into over 20 languages, have been featured on multiple best of year lists, including Square Books Junior bestseller list, um, and we and has received many regional and librarian awards. Kendara lives and writes in Gig Harbor, Washington, and you can visit her online at kendaraflake.com. Marissa Meyer is the number one New York Times bestselling author of the Lunar Chronicles series, the New York Times bestselling Renegades trilogy, as well as the graphic novel Wires and Nerve, volume one and two, and the Lunar Chronicles coloring book. Her first standalone novel, Heartless, was also a number one New York Times bestseller, and you can pre-order her newest novel, uh, Gilded, slated to be published in early November of this year. Uh, she lives in Tacoma, Washington with her husband and her two daughters. Um, wow, two very accomplished and wonderful uh, writers here this evening. Um, please submit any questions that you may have for either of them in a Q&A, and I will come back later in the evening to moderate those and stick around at the end. We're doing a little giveaway. There's a wheel. Um, it's going to be great, but I think everyone's tired of hearing me talk, so I'm going to get out of here. Um, thank you both so much for spending your evening with us. Um, I'm really excited about this. All right. Y'all have fun. Awesome. Yay. Thank you. Hi, Kendara. Hey, how are you? I am 
I'm so good. I'm so excited to be here and congratulations on the launch of all these bodies. Thank you. Um, it's It's been a while. I haven't had a book come out since 2019. And then that pandemic thing happened. And who is time? Like, I don't know what time <laughs> is. So this feels very weird. I didn't realize that your last book came out that long ago. Yeah. I binge read the Three Dark Crown series. And it was just like, amazing and making the choice to like not read them as they were coming out and to wait until they were all out was one of the best life choices I've ever made. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you so much for inviting me to join you on today's celebration um, and for agreeing to let me use the audio for the Happy Writer podcast. I'm really thrilled to be able to have you. Well, thank you for having me on the podcast. I love writing or listening to The Happy Writer, although I do feel like an extra layer of pressure to be like audibly interesting instead of, you know, just like I could do this and the Zoom would be okay. But like, I actually have to say smart things because we're doing the podcast. Yeah, I'm sad that everyone listening to the podcast didn't get to see your little dance shimmy right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on that note, it is customary to kick off every episode um, by talking about something that's making me happy. Uh, but today I'm going to pass that honor off to you. What is making you happy this week? Oh, my goodness. Uh, well, obviously, it's always wonderful to have a book come out, even though it's nerve wracking. And I had a stress dream last night that I actually overslept and missed this whole event. Oh. Even though it took place at 3.30 in the afternoon, I woke up at the three in the night. Oh my God, it's been over for hours. <laughs> I didn't even know. So um, yeah, so definitely having a book out. And right now I also made myself this like delightful boozy milkshake themed for all these bodies. So it's, this is Michael's murdery milkshake and it's what? basically like vanilla ice cream with like some grenadine at the bottom to look like blood. And there's a cherry in here somewhere because you know, I'm turning everything into a celebration during the pandemic. I don't even care how small it is. And boozy milkshakes make me happy. No, that's a brilliant idea. I'm really jealous. I wish you would have told me and then I could have had something too. I didn't know this was a minute. happy hour event. <laughs> <laughs> it was totally last minute. I was just like, I have ice cream and I have cherries and I'm, I have alcohol and I'm doing it right now. It's that's so on brand to too. Second. If people could see it, it looks like there's blood in the bottom. Right? Yeah, perfectly gory for this book. Mixology, mixology, it's, it's a new hobby. <laughs> I took, um, this is totally off topic, years and years ago, I took a bartending class with my dad. And it was like one of the coolest things we've ever done together. So for like 12 months, I had an actual bartending license. Oh my God, yeah. you took enough to have like an actual bartending license? I had an license. actual so cool. license and we bartended, I think three weddings even. Wow. Yeah, random tidbit about Marissa Meyer. <laughs> can you do any bar tricks? Like, can you throw the bottles and catch them? No, no. I, I'm just like really good at shaking the shaker. That's, All right. that's my skill. Because <laughs> you could do a little shimmy. <laughs> you can. You almost have to. Yeah, like, no, that, you have to have fun with like... it. Otherwise, you're not doing it right. Mm -hmm. It's required. <laughs> All right, so... For everyone who does not have delicious boozy drinks and just really wants to hear about your new book, tell us about All These Bodies. Uh, well, All These Bodies is the story of two teenagers who get caught up in the mystery of this terrible, brutal 1950s murder spree that rips through the Midwest. So Marie Catherine Hale is the girl found covered in blood in the middle of a farmhouse where the entire family except the two-year-old baby has just been slaughtered. And 17-year-old Michael Jensen is the son of the sheriff, the son of the local sheriff, and he wants to be a journalist. And it turns out that he is the only one that she will tell her story to. So it's up to him to find out the truth. So I remember when you were first starting to write this book, uh, but I, if I remember right, and you can correct me if this isn't true, but I feel like I remember you saying that it was one of those books that had been kicking around in your head for like a long time um, before you actually sat down to write it. How long was this story brewing and where did the like initial seed of inspiration come from? 
Well, actually all these bodies, the idea for it, all these bodies has been around since before Three Dark Crowns was, mm. oddly enough. And, but all these bodies is such a strange idea. I mean, it's like true crime with a vampire and that's just odd. And it doesn't like <laughs> immediately scream like, yes, write that. So when I pitch- It doesn't, to idea, me it kind of does. <laughs> Clearly you need to write this book. <laughs> When I pitched both ideas to my agent, you know, it was between, hey, I got true crime with a vampire or I've got, you know, three murderous queens who have to kill each other on their 16th birthday and they each have a magical gift. She was like, right, that one. So (laughs) I did. And all these bodies was very put out about that, you know, Mm -hmm. so then it just took the time to roll around in my head and get weirder and weirder and stranger and stranger and keep adding more murdery elements to itself. Until finally, when Three Dark Crowns was over, it was like, now? And I was like, fine. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I, I was able, actually, I did start writing it when we were on that retreat together. Aw, memories. Years, years and years ago. I know, I know. I miss writing retreats. <laughs> we actually get <laughs> stuff done during those. <laughs> so if I recall correctly, in your author's note of the book, you mentioned that it was loosely inspired by some real life murders. Can you talk about how those influenced the story? Yes, yes. So All These Bodies was actually inspired by three true things. Um, The slaughter of the Clutter family in Holcomb, Kansas in 1959, which we all know because that was Truman Capote's book In Cold Blood. And um, In Cold Blood was like the main inspiration behind my narrator, Michael, because I was always fascinated on how the way that Truman Capote just walked into this small town who had just been completely traumatized by the slaying and then just kind of cracked them open and, and charmed his way into their lives. And he ended up with this intimate portrait of this small town um, and also ended up with having a very strange and somewhat inappropriate relationship with the killers eventually. Uh, Anybody who's seen Capote can, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Um, The other true things that All These Bodies was inspired by was the vampire hysteria of New England, which um, we know now was just tuberculosis, but when the settlers and um, they didn't know what tuberculosis was, they just saw people getting thinner and thinner and coughing up blood and then somebody would die and then the rest of the house, it would happen to them. So they thought, oh, well, naturally that person was a vampire. Now they're coming back from the dead and they're sucking the life out of their whole family. So we better like dig them up and cut off their head and take out their heart and burn it in the town square, which they did to many, many people up and down the Northeast, even as far into the Midwest as Minnesota, there was Um, There were documented vampire exhumations in Minnesota at the time. And the final crime that All These Bodies is based on is the 11 victim killing spree of Charlie Starkweather and his 14-year-old girlfriend, Carol Ann Fugate. So they were really young and she always said that she was only a hostage, but he got the death penalty and she served a very long prison sentence. Uh, she was convicted as an accomplice and I was always fascinated by that story and how she was so young and he was older and he was cooler and he had like the leather jacket and the cigarette hanging off his bottom lip and I'm like what happened like what transpired to bring this girl on this horrible bloody odyssey and so I've yeah it was it was a lot of fun doing research on all these terrible things I have to tell you. (laughs) I mean, that's, you know, such human nature that's, these things are terrifying and weird and creepy, but fascinating too. And to, as a writer, like wanting to dig into somebody's head and see what were they really thinking and feeling and going through that led to these things happening. It's, for me, I find it, it can be almost kind of cathartic in a way to like take these horrifying things from real life, but then kind of try to write it into a fictional story. Did you get that Um, at all? Well, I like that morbid kind of stuff all the time. Me too. (laughs) (laughs) I I just, I like it. Um, 
but it was really fascinating to you know follow the cases and and look back with you know a, a different perspective a more distance from it and just see how the media treated carol and you know she was just a kid but they presented her as this horrible promis promiscuous just a bad girl and she was convicted in the court of public opinion long before you know her trial was over and it was you know it was just I, I mean, it, honestly, it kind of pissed me off because she was, yeah. yeah, they, they totally, you know, oh, just because a girl is presented as promiscuous, clearly she's a murderer because <laughs> you A to B to C, that's just how it goes. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Well, it is interesting too that, and not that people don't hold weird beliefs and opinions today, but so many things in this book are like straight from the time and the way that people talk about women and think about women and girls and, you know, and just in general, just on a larger scape, the, I guess, world building in this book is so realistic, even though it is a true setting, Minnesota, um, at the end of the 1950s, you really did a great job of immersing us in that, you know, it's in the way people talk, the lingo, the slang, it's, you know, the food that they're eating, the way that they decorate their houses. I mean, I could see everything so clearly. What was your strategy for kind of bringing this setting to life like that? Well, I mean, I, I, I grew up in a small town in Minnesota, so I wanted to treat it very carefully, much in the same way that Truman Capote treated the citizens and the location of Holcomb. I wanted it to feel very real. Small towns have always been fascinating to me. They're very insular. They have their secrets. They have their own way of doing things. And even the really friendly ones in Minnesota know how to smile while keeping you at arm's length, you know, and they have a very safe sense of community, but they are also capable of really surprising violence. Like there is a lot of capability for violence in a small town. And um, I was interested in that. And I, I just, you know, I, even though it was in 1958 and I hopefully didn't grow up in 1958 or I look good, but <laughs> I- You might be a vampire. I might be. Things haven't really changed like that much. The things that are were true about small towns back then are still true to about them right now. So that's mm -hmm. what I wanted to focus on. I want to talk about our narrator, Michael. Um, first of all, why did you choose to have him as the narrator of the book as opposed to Marie Catherine? That was for two reasons. And I get that question um, quite frequently because they're like, it's her story. Why is he telling it? Like, why is it filtered through his eyes? I'm like, exactly. Because that <laughs> is how girls' stories were filtered back then. Like mm. there was, that's why it was so important to allow Marie to tell her story and to allow it to allow her to tell it the way that she wanted um, and to have a sympathetic ear like Michael's because the narrative that was built around her, just like the narrative that was built around Carol Ann Fugate, the actual girl, uh, they were, it was beyond their control. Just like so many of the narratives that are constructed around girls today are still beyond their control. The media takes it, um, you know, opinion, the whisper network, it just takes hold. So, from a storytelling standpoint, it was important that I not be in Marie's head because all of the secrets and the truth is in Marie's head. And if I was to write from Marie's perspective, I'd have to give all the cards away or turn her into a completely unreliable narrator in a different way than she is right now. And so I didn't want to do that. But also I just thought that filtering it through Michael, filtering it through a boy, even a very earnest, listening boy was just another layer of what I was trying to say about girls and the stories that they're allowed to tell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I loved him as a narrator in part because kind of going back to how, you know, just setting the book in the time period that it's set in, he feels like such a product of this time period and of this small town, you know, he's just a very upstanding, you know, Christian boy, very polite to his elders, respectful. 
And I felt like that gave a great depth to the things that he would say as a narrator and then the things that you could kind of read between the lines that he's not saying, the things that he's thinking, but he's too proper to actually go there. <laughs> Was he a difficult narrator for you or did you find that you fell into his voice really easily? No, Michael was a real, he was a real pleasure, honestly. I'm very <laughs> glad that I got to spend like time with him. Just a because, lovely yes, boy. Much like his character. He was so agreeable and he was so polite to me and he was very <laughs> easy to work with. Um, and his, he wants to be a journalist, you know, and what I was, another thing that I noticed when I was watching a lot of these true crime documentaries and I was listening to conf murderers give their confession and like give their accountings of these terrible things that happened. What I noticed is, hot damn, these people are not storytellers. Like many of these killers, not good at just laying it down. It was like, this is the worst thing I've ever heard, but it's also kind of boring the way you're telling me that it happened. Huh. So, um, so I started thinking like, you know, okay, not everybody is a storyteller. Maybe Marie herself isn't much of a storyteller, but actually she turns out to be a fine one. But I was very lucky in that I think Michael turned out to be a fairly competent journalist. Like he wants to be one. And I think if he goes along that path, he'll, he'll be successful because yeah, his voice was very strong and he did everything I wanted. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. He's just so sweet. I mean, he's. <laughs> He's the sheriff's son. There's actually a moment in the start of the book where it's revealed that his previous girlfriend only dated him because her dad was a reverend and she needed to like ease him into the idea of her dating. So <laughs> I'll date the sheriff's son first because he can do no wrong and then I'll dump him and I can date whoever I want after yeah. I get my reverend father used to it. So yeah. Those promiscuous girls. Oh. <laughs> Um, so I want to go back a little bit because you're talking about, um, listening to these murder tapes of murderers and their confessions. And I, as you said before, you must have had to do a ton of research. Was there anything that really like sticks out in your memory that you remember as like, you know, any like really creepy or weird facts that you came across? Um, not necessarily creepy or weird facts, The what what stood out for me this time and I mean I, I watch serial killer stuff and true crime stuff quite frequently but what stood out for me this time in this research was are you familiar with like the the slender man attacks no it was several years ago when slender man was big on creepypasta and these three girls I think they were from the midwest or maybe Pennsylvania um they were friends and they were like 12 or 13 and they thought slender man to summon him they had to kill their third best friend so they brought her into a park and just like stabbed her like 17 times i do remember hearing about <laughs> this now yes right yeah and if you hear like if you listen to them when they're saying you know oh well and then what did you do well i stabbed her and 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 you stabbed her you're like yeah i stabbed her i stabbed her like like 10 times, you know, it, it's so just like they've disassociated completely from the act. Like this had to be a very jarring, traumatic act. But if you hear it in, in their confession, in their voice, it's, it's complete. There's nothing there. It's just monotone. It's meh. Yeah. And then she bled. Like it's no, it's like, it's no big deal. So I'm like, my goodness, you know, how, how people who are, have gone through trauma, the different ways that they have to disassociate from it to survive. And um, a lot of that went into Marie's character. Yeah, I can totally see how that might have influenced her character. Yeah. I'm really curious, you know, you mentioned Michael wanting to be a journalist and, you know, if he goes down that path, you think he'd be a pretty good one um, without giving anything away. We obviously don't want to do any spoilers, but the ending is fairly open to interpretation and to some guesswork. Um, I'm really curious, do you feel like you have an idea of what happens to these characters? I do. I know, I know what really happened. I mean, I have to, right? I'm, I'm the writer. I have to know. Um, 
but I, I made a promise to myself when I started writing that I would never actually say because people have their own opinions. And that's kind of the point. Um, the reason that I left it, the ending open-ended was because in part because of Carol Ann Fugate. She was convicted, but she always said, no, I'm innocent. I was a hostage Like to this day. She's still alive. Um, and she just asked most recently, she just asked for a pardon, I think in 2006, because she says she was innocent and everybody involved is dead. So what do we have? We don't know, even though we have a conviction and we have all the evidence that came in the trial, you know, there was still room for doubt. So even though we as humans, we really like to have answers about what really occurred when something like this happens, we don't really, it's really just them and the victim who knows what actually occurred. And we just kind of have to make up our own minds. So also, I mean, a big part of the book is, you know, about truths and the subjective nature of it and how people need to make their own sometimes. And yeah, so. Yeah. Yep, I know it's gonna drive some people up the wall. <laughs> <laughs> like it though and as a, a writer I appreciate I think it's a, a daring decision when someone chooses not to tie everything into a neat bow but this is I think the exact sort of book that requires that and I love that it leaves that bit of mystery at the end I hope I hope so I hope you're right <laughs> <laughs> so I want to switch topics um a little bit well not topics so much um but just kind of a broader craft slash career question. You went from writing three dark crowns, uh, four books and two novellas and multiple protagonists and subplots and huge world building and murder and betrayal on and on and on to writing this book, you know, single narrator, much quieter story, a standalone. Why? <laughs> and how, what was that like for you? And it's slim, right? It's just, it's only like 70,000 words. It's just a little baby. And Keep you so up you'd all think, night and then you're done. Yeah, you'd think <laughs> that it would be like a breeze, but actually all these bodies was, was quite difficult. And um, I remember when we were on that writing retreat together, at the end of it, we all gave our word counts and mine was like pathetic. And you had written like a novel and it, <laughs> you're like, I can't remember what you said, but you're like 30,000. And I'm like, eight. <laughs> eight, eight birds. Um, eight birds. So, <laughs> um, so all these bodies, every word, you know, it was very carefully and very deliberately chosen. So if I got a thousand words a day out of it, I considered myself lucky. It was, it just wrote a lot slower. And as for why a standalone and why like this, well, for one thing, it had been waiting to be told for a really long time. It had put up with four years of murdering queens and just, you know, like waiting there for me to do something with it. So I had to. And also I realized that my first book uh, was a standalone and then Anna Dressed in Blood was a duet and The Goddess War was a trilogy and Three Dark Crowns was a quartet. So I thought, well, I can go for five or I can start back over and starting back over just seemed like much more manageable. I mean, did you <laughs> feel the same way when you um, moved from the trilogy to Instant Karma? Like it was. I did. No, Instant Karma felt like such a palate cleanser book for me um, and something. Yeah, one and done. You know, you tell the story, you enjoy it, have fun with it and then move on. Um, and I found it to be really refreshing. Um, but then at the same time, as soon as I was done with that, I felt like my brain was like recharged and like, okay, ready for something bigger again. It's exactly, exactly. Because yeah. after we're in these big worlds, you know, our, our brains have only been there really actively. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I needed a palate cleanser. I needed some time away. I needed some time to shift gears and, you know, yeah. So yeah. That, was, that was all these bodies. Yeah. And do you know what you're going to be doing next? Are you moving into a big epic world again? I am. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's another fantasy series. And right now it's code name is Amazon Jedi's. 
<laughs> that's exactly what it is. It's like, and everyone's like, where can we pre-order that? It's like if the Jedi's <laughs> were Amazons and, you know, like Obi-Wan was an Amazon and he had to train this little Anakin Amazon, you know, up and yeah, how to join the order. So that's basically what it is. Um, and I'm also writing a new series of books set in the universe of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So that's what I'm doing awesome. now. And it's, um, I, I don't know if it's called Frankie the Vampire Slayer, the series, or if it's like the first book is called In Every Generation. So, and that's been another palate cleanser because that's basically like fan fiction and it's so fun. <laughs> so much fun. Yeah. I love it. I cannot wait. Uh, I know we probably have some questions waiting for us, but before we get to Q&A, um, I would love to wrap this up with our traditional happy writer bonus round. Yes, and then can I add one question onto the end for you? No, not allowed, so No? <laughs> this is your event, Kendara. Yes, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, here we go. Journalist or police detective? Journalist. You seem so disappointed in that answer. Well, I feel like police detective is a much more exciting, but journalist. Yeah. Yeah. Ghost or vampire? Vampire. I think ghosts sometimes get such a sad rap. Like it depends. Like I always wonder, like, what if you get stuck in the place that you died? And what if you die at a Walmart? Like just, I mean, that's, <laughs> oh my, I get very, very nervous about that. So oh, definitely, that's a definitely the most interesting Walmart in the country. I mean, I guess Walmart's, it's going to be there for a long time and the stock is always <laughs> changing, but I- It's got everything it. you need. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Uh, Matt McBride or Lish McBride? <laughs> you know, I didn't even realize that I'd used her last name until I was in draft two. And I'm really? like, oh, I hope she's okay with this. It's like on page one. And I was like, <laughs> oh, cool. Is there going to be someone named after me too? <laughs> It just, it, you know what it was is because um, when I had Matt McBride, who's the editor of uh, the local newspaper, when I had him in my head and I was picturing him, I pictured that old actor, Matt McCoy. Mm. So I'm like, well, I can't call him Matt McCoy clearly <laughs> because so I'm like, Matt Mick, Matt Mick and Matt McBride, it just popped out. I'm sure because I know Lish. Yeah. But, yeah, <laughs> I'm well, sure. But I mean, gone. between the two, I mean, we have to choose Lish, right? Of course. Clear. I should hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Not that I didn't like Matt McBride. <laughs> what is your favorite writing snack? My favorite writing snack. I actually I don't eat when I'm writing. I have coffee, and it is the only coffee I allow myself. So that should be considered a snack. Also, the sheer amount of sugar I put in it, it should definitely be considered a snack. Yeah. What about boozy drinks? Is that like just for events or is that a writing yeah. method as well? That's just for events. Um, <laughs> if the writing day is really, really long, I might have like a glass of wine towards the end of it, but then the writing really tapers off quickly. <laughs> <laughs> We've learned this about ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> if all these bodies had a theme song, what would it be? Oh, oh gosh. I mean, it'd have to be something from the 1950s, wouldn't it? Mm, it's, and I, I don't know yeah. any of that. They were and all so Minnesota, happy. So maybe like a polka, 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 you know, like one of those just, and it'd be like ironically upbeat while everybody was yeah. getting murdered. Yeah. 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 One that came to my mind was like Werewolves of London, but I don't know, not vampire enough to mm. werewolves. I still like, you know, it has the same vibe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what is the best writing advice that you have ever received? Get it on the page. That was given to me by um, one of my, my master's tutors, which, you know, it's something that we've heard before, but she phrased it in such a way that it made so much sense. Like, of course you have to have something on the page. I can't grade it if it's not on the page. So, you know, I can't grade it and I can't read it. So it has to be, you actually have to do the writing. Yeah, no, that's good. And I think some of us forget sometimes when we get stuck in our heads with 
make it perfect. It must be great. How am I going to capture all these emotions? And it's like, no, you can't, you can't worry about that yet. Just get it down. Yeah. It's hard to overcome that feeling mm -hmm. of knowing that, that it isn't perfect and you're going to have to do so much to it despite working so hard on it the first time. <laughs> but that's just something we have to do. Yeah. It's a part of the process. Yeah. Uh, lastly, obviously tonight, a lot of people here are already big fans of yours, um, but for people listening to the podcast who may not be familiar with your books um, and want to go check you out, where can they find you? They can find me on Instagram mostly, Kendara Blake. Um, I'm on Twitter, but it's mostly for, do for doom scrolling at this point. So <laughs> if you ask me a question on Twitter, I'll get back to you, but I'm not, I don't post a lot. And then I, I have like my website, kendarablake.com. Oh, can I get, to, can I ask you your question? Now? Okay. Yes, sure. Yes. Yay. Okay. I actually wrote this one down on my phone, like ages ago <laughs> when I thought of it. So a while ago, I noticed that you were introducing the girls to Twilight. Oh yeah. Documenting their reactions to the, the men of Twilight. So I wanted to know what your reaction would be. So if you could go on a date with Edward or Jacob from Twilight, which would you choose and how would that date go? Okay, is it an option to say I'd like to go on a date with Bella's dad? Oh, Charlie hits different now, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm totally team Bella's dad. Um, but if I have to choose one of the two, then I will. That's like a requirement no. of this. <laughs> I think, you know, we can go down this, this um, Charlie's dad path because would, that would like make you Bella's stepmom. Like Bella's sure. stepmom. Sure, I'll take that. Like, yeah. yeah, it's just, I mean, he is so, he's mature. He's, you know, rock steady and kind and compassionate and um both Edward I mean as when I was young a teenager I was totally team Edward um but in all of my years and wisdom I honestly don't think that either of the relationships are very good relationships I think that she could do better <laughs> all right yeah. So a date with Charlie. I bet a date with really Charlie. Nice. And it would probably no. not be like super exciting. I don't know. I don't even know what Charlie does. We'd go fishing or something. You would. You would probably <laughs> go fishing and it'd be really charming and totally chill. Yeah. 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 I like charming and chill. How about you? Who would you go with? Oh, well, uh, um, I used to say Jacob because of the dog sledding that we could do. <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> But now I'm, you know, I'm older and I think I would go on a date with Edward and just make him carry me around on his back everywhere. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, that seems really convenient. Yeah. Like, he really moves and you're just right. on it, So Right. Or even just to like experience like the flying through the trees mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. For like one date, that would be pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. I'd probably get really sick afterwards. <laughs> but, but it'd be worth it it'd be worth it you just have to do it everybody should do it once like yeah. everyone should like offer that experience package yeah. Yeah. if he ever runs out of the other things to do right he's got time <laughs> he's got time all right should we do some q a from the audience yeah i've got a lot of great questions um this has been so fun i've just been kind of like clapping in like this little corner of my room. I, I've so enjoyed this. And I know that our our readers have too. There's lots of questions. I don't think we'll be able to get to them all, but um, uh, I'm gonna hit a couple. So, um, oh, this is from an anonymous attendee. Um, they say, you talk about Michael like he's a real person. Do all of your characters feel like re real people to you or only some? And I'd love to hear the answer for both of y'all if, if you were willing. Uh, yeah, for me, absolutely. All of my characters are real. All of my worlds are real. I believe in the multiverse theory and everything that I'm writing down is happening concurrently somewhere. So I'm just a scribe. I love that. I don't really think of my worlds as existing, <laughs> um, but definitely by the end of the writing process, all the characters feel very real. Um, not always at the beginning. Um, it sometimes can take me a couple of drafts to feel like I've really gotten to know them and have feelings for them. Um, but by the end, they all very much feel like real people. 
And this is just a question for me, kind of working off of that one. Um, like, how do you say goodbye? Or, or, or are they just always with you? Do you have this just kind of like posse no. all, all the time? Man, that would be like, they would, they would annoy me. Like, yeah. they, would, <laughs> they would be bothersome. Some of these characters would not. So no, it is, it's hard to say goodbye at the end of the book. That's, that's why it's, you know, sad. And I still wonder sometimes, like, why don't they check in? Why don't they tell me what they're up to? I'm like a I mom who had, like, kids <laughs> went away from college. And yeah, because I wonder often what Kaz from Anna Dress and Blood is doing. And I mm. know he had way more adventures and I'm kind of irritated that he hasn't told me any of them. <laughs> That's a great point. I, yeah, kind of similarly, they don't usually hang around. Um, but for me, it is sad saying goodbye, but I'm always looking forward to the next project. And so by the time I'm wrapping something up, I'm so eager to get started on the, the shiny new thing that I'm really excited about. That makes sense. The yeah, and I know it's like same with readers right too, you know, like, you know, you, you fall in love with these characters and then, then it's over and, and you're sad about it, but, but then there, there's the next, next new book. So, um, I mean, and it's not quite the same, but I think that we could all kind of empathize a little bit. Um, okay, so we're running out of time. So I thought maybe three rapid fire questions um, for each of y'all, if that's okay. Um, okay, so first, um, favorite true crime podcast, Ooh. if you have one. Or maybe not um, favorite, one that you like. I can't think of the names. Like I have some that I have really loved, but I don't know what the names of them were. Um, oh gosh. So there was one that my husband and I listened to. This is supposed to be rapid fire. Terrible. Okay. Um, and I'm not even able to think of who the, the name of the, okay, go back to me. Kendara, do you have it? Um, I don't have like a name of a podcast, but I've gotten really into like shows about podcasts or about like true crime writing so like I was very into the HBO documentary about Michelle McNamara and her hunt for the Golden State Killer yeah um, I'll be gone in the dark that was just fantastic and so fascinating and so like just timely like they had a bonus episode where they sentenced the guy I mean, yeah. it doesn't get more timely than that um, and also I've, I've been watching the second season of Truth Be Told which is about like a true crime podcaster but She's not a real one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, it's going to drive me nuts. That's, um, but I can't think okay. of this um, one, um, that we watched that was based on a local story here in Washington. Um, but the guy murdered his wife and then later ended up murdering their two children and horrible, tragic story. Um, but the, the podcast itself was fascinating. Well, you know, we shouldn't give like other podcasts airtime on, on your podcast. Anyway, so. <laughs> Shame on me. It was a good question, though. Thank you. It was for a good question. It. Um, you stumped them. So, um, okay, next one. What is your favorite supernatural creature or being? Well, I'm fresh off of writing Gilded, which is based off of a lot of Germanic uh, mythology and folklore. And one of my favorite new creatures is the Nachtkrab. Um, which it means night raven and they are pretty much ravens that don't have eyes and have like really tattered wings and if they don't like you they will pick out your heart I hate that <laughs> I, love them. I love them so much oh <laughs> uh, what about you Kendara um I don't know I guess it'd be like a tie between like vampires and gods they're both fun and, you know, yeah. they've been done so many different ways and I, I like them pretty much every time. Yeah, that's true. Um, okay, I think, I thought I had one more, but um, oh, there's so many good ones. Um, well, rather than me just kind of mumbling a lot around, maybe we should do the, oh, okay, no, I found it. Um, okay, what were your favorite parts to write in all these bodies? And, and gilded without it. And again, no spoilers if you can. Mm. Um, in all these bodies, I really liked writing Percy Valentine 
Uh, Percy Valentine is Michael's best friend and he's just like the sweetest, dopiest thing that you've ever met. And I, I just loved it every time that he walked on the page. He's stupidly loyal, like so loyal. It's not even a question. And he's so supportive. And around town, he's kind of got this reputation as being like the clown and not too smart, but actually he's a very intuitive and sensitive person. So I love Percy. <laughs> Uh, my answer is the same for every book that I write, and that's the kissing parts. I just really love writing romance. <laughs> that's great. I feel like that's a lot of people's like kind of fears. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that you enjoy it. I, I know other authors kind of dread that part, but um, <laughs> not me. Awesome. All I'm, it's all awesome. that I care about. I just am writing the whole book part. just to get to this point. <laughs> Be like a whole other like, podcast called the kissy parts um they're just as challenging they're i find them more challenging than like big action scenes so i am so be, i'm yeah. consistently impressed by marissa's ability to write like an innovative kissing scene with like, just the right <laughs> amount of yearning and just the right <laughs> focus points like that, i noticed I, that and know that i'm like mm -hmm. that's so funny i do start to worry now you know 15 books in that i'm gonna start repeating myself like how many ways can you describe this <laughs> Oh, <laughs> well, I mean, both like, writing a big epic scene or a kissing scene, but both of those sound really scary, but I feel like more people have like experience with, with one and, and not with the other. So maybe that's why it's more intimidating, but anyway, good on you. Uh, but should we, should we do the wheel? So um, Kendara, do you want to explain kind of why we're spinning this thing while I get it set up or? Yes, I can okay. So for um, residents with a U.S. mailing or for, you know, attendees with a U.S. mailing address, uh, we just wanted to say thank you for coming and thank you to Square Books for hosting us um, by raffling off a copy of All These Bodies as well as a pre-order of Marissa's new book, Gilded, which I have just finished. And I have to tell you that you should pre-order it. Even if you don't win it, you should pre-order it right now because this is my new favorite Marissa Meyer book. And that's saying Aww. what? <laughs> Thanks, Kendara. <laughs> and, and while I have everybody kind of like on the edge of their seats, um, we have a few signed first editions left. Uh, most of them are already gone, but we also have book plates. So um, still get a, a signature. You can order it on our website, uh, squarebooks.com, or give us a call. Or if you live in Oxford or the surrounding areas, just come and see us. We'd love to see you. Um, and I would also like to remind you all that uh, wonderful events like this, in-person, virtual, hybrid, whatever, they're not possible without your support. So um, if you haven't bought the book yet, uh, either of them, uh, please buy it with us. Uh, Shop Indie. Uh, we love it when you do that. And it enables us to keep doing what we love, uh, which is this stuff. Um, so, but now that I've done the guilt trip, um, we'll spin and uh, I will email the winners. Uh, and okay, are we ready? So this one is for, I guess, all these bodies. Here we go. The suspense. I know. <gasps> Heather. Yes. All right, I'll take you off the list so you can't win again. Okay, so let's go one more time. This is for Gilded. Zora, congratulations. All right, so um, I will email both of you um, to get your um, shipping info and um, all right, let's stop sharing this and I guess say good night. Um, or I guess good afternoon for you, Kendara, or both of y'all. You're both on the West Coast. So um, mm -hmm. thanks for spending your afternoon with us. Um, this has been really, really fun. Um, I'm really honored that we got to host your debut event um, or what do you call it? Pub day event. But uh, I'll, I'll pass it off to y'all and then we'll, we'll say good night, I guess. Okay, thank Bye. you so much. Thank you so much for hosting us. Really yeah, fun. Good time. Yes, thank you, Square Books, and thank you, Kendara, for letting me be a part of it. Oh, thank you for joining me. Oh, yeah, thank you both for, for writing books. Um, makes our job really easy. They're fun to sell. I uh, know they're fun to read, and we are just so grateful.
for all you do. And thanks to all of our readers for um, enabling all of us to do what, what we love, which is uh, talk about books. Um, so I guess with that, we will wrap it up and um, y'all take care. Maybe next time we can do this in Oxford, but um, in the meantime, uh, we look forward to read more of your work and I'm rambling, it's hard to say goodbye. So we're just gonna <laughs> push the button. Okay, <laughs> bye. <laughs> bye.